You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. It may sound dull, maybe even monotonous, but this is what miracles sound like. This is the sound of a child surgery being performed by a robot. Our personalized care leads to miraculous things. Like innovative procedures with less pain and faster recovery. Children's Hospital Colorado. Here, it's different. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 105, Highway to the Danger Zone, Part 3, The Further on the Edge. This week, a big thank you goes out to Randall, who chose to support the podcast by becoming a member. You can find out more about how you can support the podcast by becoming a member over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. This week, I'm, we are going to do some follow-up on three of our main players in the start of the war, Britain, France, and Germany. For Britain, we will give a summary of their ongoing rearmament efforts. For France, we will look at how their plans for collective security had so thoroughly fallen apart during the interwar years. And for Germany, we will discuss how Hitler and the German government reacted to their two great political victories, the Munich Agreement and then the occupation of what was left of Czechoslovakia. While these three nations were not the only nations involved in the war, it would be the decisions made by the three governments that would turn what could have been a localized war in Poland into the Second World War. Britain in the 1930s was very different than Britain of even 30 years earlier, in the years before the First World War. The British Empire had exited the 1800s in an economically dominant position, fueled by industrial powers of the home islands and the massive resources from the empire that fueled that industrial base. But due to the First World War, and more importantly just shifts in the industrialization of other nations, most of that advantage had evaporated by 1930. Importantly for rearmament, there was also some questions being asked about whether or not Britain should go to war at all and if it was possible for a war to result in positive outcomes for nations like Britain, who stood to gain very little, either monetarily, economically, or geographically. This tied into the very powerful peace movements that were present in Britain during these years, which held wide public support for a policy of peace and collective security. The policy of appeasement was the logical outcome of such beliefs, as it was the best way to maintain that peace in the face of revisionists who wanted political and geographic change. The problem, of course, was that appeasement only works when an individual can in fact be appeased, which requires their desires to be in some way limited, and limited within the bounds of what other nations consider reasonable. We of course now know that Hitler's demands were not reasonable, at least when it came to other nations agreeing to them. Even before appeasement became the dirty word that it would be after 1939, During the mid-1930s, British rearmament began in earnest. The catalyst for this push was the open rearmament of Germany, which then caused other nations to start investing far more in defense than they had during the previous years. In March 1935, the British Defense Requirements Committee would publish a report that was not exactly rosy in its outlook on where British defenses were relative to its most likely enemies. It would say, quote, We are approaching a point when we are not possessed of the necessary means of defending ourselves against an aggressor. An additional expenditure on the armaments of the three defense services can therefore no longer be safely ignored. The longer Britain delayed in rearmament, the more dire the situation would be as other nations expanded their own efforts. The naval treaties that had been signed in Washington in 1921 were also about to expire or essentially become invalid with the exit of Japan which prompted massive investments in new naval capital ship construction, something that had not seen large investments since the early 1920s. The demands of the Royal Navy, the Royal Air Force, and seemingly always last on the list the British Army, 
caused the total overall British defense expenditures to double between 1934 and 1938. But even at that point, the overall spending was less than 7% of national total income, which, if not a third smaller in absolute terms, was a third smaller than Germany in terms of overall government commitment. For reference, in 2022, many larger nations hover around the 2% of GDP on defense, with big spenders like the United States and Russia doubling that figure. While the percentage number may not have been very impressive, the effects of the millions and millions in government spending on the economy was very positive. Military industries had to rapidly expand their their spending and their employment numbers to meet the new and growing government demands. And about a third of the total economic growth or employment growth between 1935 and 1937 came from the iron and steel industries, which were basically the foundation of rearmament in the 1930s. It quickly got to the point where there was a serious lack of workers, especially skilled workers, the number of which had shriveled in the early 1930s during the harsh economic climate of the slump. By the time that Germany invaded Poland, British rearmament efforts were outpacing that of Germany, but then Germany had its string of great victories. Britain and France were not in a position in 1939 to attack Germany. But over the first nine months of the war, their inability to contain German expansion robbed them of the dominant economic position they had enjoyed during the First World War. With Italy, Eastern Europe, their conquest in Norway, and good relations with other Nordic countries, the wide expanses of the British Empire would shift from a competitive advantage to a strategic nightmare, as they were not able to properly take advantage of the better economic situation they had experienced after 1914. While Britain had based much of its pre-war planning on its ability to economically outpace Germany when it counted, France had long prepared a different strategy, diplomatic encirclement. Basically, France wanted friends, and as many as it could get, to combat Germany. There was, of course, the idea of collective security, which was baked into the League of Nations, but this was felt to not be sufficient, and France never had full confidence in the League. In fairness, as history would show, this skepticism in the ability of the League of Nations to defend its members was completely and totally justified. Instead, France wanted to resort to a more old-school approach to putting a band back together. Treaties with nations that provided alliances, guarantees, and specific calls to action if national interests were threatened. These were the familiar methods of nations banding together and had been an important piece of European diplomacy for centuries. From the very beginning, there were a few nations that were high on the list of French priorities, mostly due to geographic positioning. Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Italy. Relations with Poland would always be a tough nut to crack, mostly due to Polish resistance to agreements that might cause relations with Germany or the Soviet Union to sour. But in the years immediately after Polish independence, France appeared to be the best possible source of assistance to the new government in Warsaw, and so the appropriate agreements were signed. Similar agreements would be signed with Czechoslovakia, with the new nation appearing to be the perfect ally for France. The new Czechoslovak nation had a lengthy border with Germany, a well-funded military, and had an industrial base that punched far above its geographic weight class. This industrial base would be important not just to the Czechoslovakian military, but by the late 1930s would be crucial to the rearmament efforts of other nations as well, with both Britain and Russia signing contracts with Skoda to import its products. However, the agreements between Poland and Czechoslovakia would be placed behind the relations between France and its Western European neighbors, Italy being the most critical one. It was seen as the link between Western and Eastern Europe, and its position in the Mediterranean would ensure that agreements between France and other nations had a sea highway on which to communicate and provide additional support. Also, it would secure French access to its Northern African colonies. But of course, there was a major problem that would not be apparent until the late 1930s. The government in Italy, led by Mussolini, was far closer ideologically to that of the Nazi government. One nation that was very specifically not on France's list of allies, or nations with which an alliance was pursued, was the Soviet Union. Even though its performance on the battlefield was less than amazing during the First World War, Russia had been a critical piece of French planning before 1914. However, the revolution, and then the creation of the communist government, had made it politically challenging for the French to rekindle that previous alliance. The largest problem would be the internal politics of France. During the 1920s, there was the fear of a revolution, which during that time the Soviet government in Moscow 
was still at least rhetorically supporting worldwide, if it wasn't necessarily supporting in its actions. Then, during the early 1930s, there was a resistance from the conservative governments to sign agreements with a nation that supported its political rivals in the Socialist Party. When the Popular Front came to power, there was then the desire of the socialist leaders to push back against the persistent rumors circulated by their political rivals that they were just puppets of Moscow. This was also, there was also, honestly, just a general anti-communist view from many important members of French politics and industry that would always advocate for a rejection of uh, relations with Soviet Union that were beyond just the most essential, like like simple economic agreements. But the failure to form a close relationship with the Soviet Union was not France's biggest problem, but instead its inability to proactively assist its allies really anywhere. The French military had become very defensive in its outlook after the First World War, and it would never really move away from this view. This meant that when the nations of Eastern Europe were threatened, the French army found itself unable to assert itself when needed. At no time was this more apparent and crucial than in the run-up to the Munich Agreement. Even if the political will had been present to go to war over the Sudetenland question, the French military cautioned against it. This fed into the existing proclivity of the French government to value one relationship above all others close relationships with London. And with Chamberlain and the British government pushing for appeasement, there was little that Daladay and the French could do to counteract such actions. In his book France and the Nazi Threat, Jean-Baptiste de Russell would say, quote, The government was well aware that France had abandoned an ally strategically placed in a difficult position, but well-armed nevertheless. In the formal sense, it had not betrayed the alliance. Morally, things looked much worse, however, since France had demanded that the ally agree to its own surrender. End quote. Once the Munich Agreement was signed and France's closest ally in Eastern Europe greatly reduced in potency, it was locked into relations with Britain as not just the preferred route forward, but the only path forward. The important lesson of the collapse of the French diplomatic agreements is that such agreements are only viable as long as the strongest member of those agreements, which was France, is able to and willing to enforce them. By not ensuring its ability to come to the aid of other nations in a military conflict and then surrendering its diplomatic independence to Britain, 20 years of French diplomatic efforts were undone. We're outside the travel agency, a cannabis store that's got everyone buzzing. I've been over 20 times at this point. When I walked in, I felt like I'm about to get elevated and lifted in the best way. Blows my expectations out of the water. Some of the best customer service I've had in a store. So nice. Amazing vibe. Come down to the travel agency and see for yourself. For use only by adults age 21 and older. Keep out of reach of children and pets. In case of accidental ingestion or overconsumption, contact the National Poison Control Center. Consume responsibly. Some of us love history. Others used to or never did because history was presented as nothing but the rote memorization of names, dates, and facts. Basically, the story got left out, and that made history kind of suck. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a university professor with a PhD in history, and bringing history to life is my passion. That's why I created my podcast, History That Doesn't Suck. I want to teach you everything you need to know about U.S. history, but I do so through stories. Let me tell you about George Washington begging his men not to mutiny against Congress. Clara Barton saving Union soldiers amid enemy fire. Enslaved Frederick Douglass risking his life for liberty. And about so many other figures as their real experiences make industrialization, social movements, and even congressional debates and tax policy come to life. Subscribe to History That Doesn't Suck today. And join me, Professor Greg Jackson, every other week for a new episode. Where I'd like to tell you a story. When discussing history, particularly political history, tidy breakpoints have an almost inescapable pull. In a book, it's how you structure chapters. In podcasts, you know, you always look for those tidy breaks for episodes or series. Before Munich, Munich, after Munich, then the invasion of Czechoslovakia, then Poland. All neat, nice, and tidy. But of course, history is always more difficult and confusing. Germany's turn towards Poland did not wait until the end of its dealings with Czechoslovakia. In fact, just a month after Munich, discussions would already be opened with the Polish government 
that would lay the groundwork for the next year of disagreements, which would continue to amplify the tension between the two nations and would eventually be used as the excuse for the invasion. On October 24, 1938, the German Foreign Minister Ribbentrop would meet with the Polish Ambassador Joseph Lipski with the goal of starting the conversations that would lead to a general settlement. The core of the problem was always going to be around Danzig and the Polish Corridor, that area of Poland which had been carved out of East Prussia after the First World War to give Poland access to the Baltic Sea. The German government wanted the entire area back, but they would also claim that they were open to discussing a compromise, maybe just a motorway or a railway that would connect German-controlled areas of East Prussia to the rest of Germany. But in both cases, Germany wanted to have full rights to the territory used by those two transportation corridors, which Poland then did not like because they would, in essence, be cut off from the Baltic. You can't have two nations owning one piece of territory. Ambassador Lipsky would not provide an immediate official answer when, when these proposals were made, although he would say that he personally saw no possibility of it happening, but for a more official response, he would have to consult with Warsaw. And when he did receive that answer, it was definitive. It would arrive a week later from Warsaw, and it basically echoed what Lipsky had already said. There was no chance of this happening. The real sticking point in any proposal would always be the idea of Germany being given some kind of sovereign territorial claims over some kind of corridor that bisected the Polish corridor, because then that would defeat the purpose of the Polish corridor, which was to give them access to the Baltic. There was more wiggle room on the topic of Danzig, with Poland willing to negotiate a new agreement with Germany that would supersede the agreements that had previously been made through the League of Nations. After these initial approaches were rebuffed, Hitler and the German government immediately began to move forward with future military operations. At this point, the emphasis was still on Danzig, with the order given by Hitler for the German army to, be a, to reach out and occupy Danzig really at a moment's notice by a surprise assault at any time that he wanted to do so. Even this idea contained a bit of a miscalculation, though, because it meant that Hitler was planning on carving off Danzig and the corridor, like he'd done in Austria and in the Sudetenland. In both cases, he had been able to obtain control of an area outside of Germany, not by military action, but instead just swift initiative, and he believed that Danzig would provide another opportunity to do the same. Not start a war, just do some political maneuvering and then race in really fast and occupy it and hope everything worked out. However, unlike Austria and Czechoslovakia, Poland would prove to be on kind of a different level when it came to being ready to resist, with clear messages being sent from the foreign minister Beck to Berlin that if Germany attempted any kind of reworking of the border regions outside of negotiations with Poland, it would result in war, straight up. This idea that a revision to the Polish border could be made without war starting, and that Poland could be in some way overawed by another swift German move, was an important aspect of German planning. Because in spring 1939, Germany was not ready for a war. Rearmament efforts were proceeding forward as quickly as possible, with ever greater targets being put in place as the rearmament efforts of other nations forced a constant redoubling of efforts. But there were always limits on how fast such efforts could be accelerated, and Germany was hitting them mainly due to a lack of raw materials or the ability to increase imports. As discussed in episode 104 a few weeks ago, during these years, the German timeline for war was around the 1942 mark, at which point the rearmament efforts would be completed and the German military would be led ready to go to war. Equally important, in the mind of Hitler and other German political leaders, they also felt that at that point the German people would be ready to go to war psychologically and ideologically, a critical component of the war effort. This brings us back to Poland, which was not only very adamant that it would not be another Czechoslovakia, it was also going to get more assistance from other nations. Poland had for the most part stayed away from the political discussions around the previous German expansion efforts, even around Czechoslovakia to itself, choosing instead to act in its own interest to reclaim some disputed territory with Czechoslovakia. But territory within Poland was an entirely different story. To defend its territory, Poland was ready and willing to go to war, and it would receive the Anglo-French guarantee in the spring and summer of 1939, which we will discuss next episode, which would make it able to go to war because it would have allies. 
While all of these things were happening with Poland, another area of effort by the German government was around the Mamel area. Mamel was part of a small strip of territory that had been removed from East Prussia by the Treaty of Versailles and put under League of Nations administration before being handed over to Lithuania in 1923. As with every other area of previously German territory that had been passed to another nation by the Treaty of Versailles, there were many in Germany that were not really a big fan of the fact that it was now controlled by Lithuania. Immediately after action had been taken in Czechoslovakia, moves began that would see Mamel transfer to Germany. The key role on the German side would be played by the German Navy, which would dispatch the pocket battleship Deutschland to Mamel. On March 20th, Ribbentrop would present an ultimatum to the Lithuanian foreign minister, demanding that the government hand over the area. The agreement would eventually be made, which was kind of inevitable. You know, Lithuania couldn't resist Germany. Tensions had been rising in the area as well, due in no small part to Nazi agitation. And so the situation in the area was really reaching a boiling point. And it was kind of at the point where there was going to be a local revolt against Lithuanian control. Most importantly for Hitler, who was on the Deutschland, sort of out at sea, getting the agreement directly from the Lithuanian government, instead of after fighting had broken out, provided the next in a long series of diplomatic victories. Hitler would enter the city on the afternoon of March 23rd to celebrate another great victory, and another great political victory. Once again, he had demanded something from another nation, and he had received it. In the months after Prague and Mamel, other pieces began to fall into place as Hitler and the German government sought to make its next move. In May, the Pact of Steel, the alliance with Italy, would be signed, providing Germany with what was, at the moment, its only real ally in case of war. Italy would make these commitments without the full information about German intentions, because the very next day after the treaty had been signed, Hitler would make it clear to German military leaders that he believed that war was inevitable. He based this fact on Germany's economic problems becoming worse as it tried to strengthen its military. The only solution for this came back to the idea at the core of the entire Nazi ideology, Lebensraum in Eastern Europe, land for the German people. What was clear from the meeting between Hitler and the German military was that Germany would go to war with Poland, and all of the diplomatic maneuverings over the following months would simply be a diversion. Planning would proceed very rapidly over the following weeks, and the case white for the German invasion of Poland would begin to evolve. The first draft would be presented to Hitler on June 15th, with the plan developed by Brosich and the German High Command. The basic structure was already in place for what would happen later in the year. Two army groups, one in the north moving south, one in the south moving north. They would converge on Warsaw and then work their way east, mopping up Polish troops as they went. Other clear preparations for war began outside of the planning divisions of the general staff, which had been in some way planning for war for for many years. That is why general staffs exists after all, they make plans for war. But elsewhere, outside of just that group of officers, other work was also being done, including work by the Minister of Economics to begin considering how to handle the possibility of an influx of prisoners of war. In July, emergency meetings would be held to determine how best to put the West Wall fortifications into the best possible position to defend against a French attack by the end of August. Germany was preparing for war by the spring of 1939. And not just the ever amorphous future war that had been part of Nazi rhetoric since the early 1930s, not the war for 1942 that had been theoretically the plan for years, but instead a very real war that would happen not years, but months in the future. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we look at some of the events in France, Russia, and Britain during the summer of 1939 as the three nations try to come together to sign an agreement which they will absolutely fail to do.